So what do I intend to do today is to finish up blood. So last time we covered the red blood cell. And so if you think in plasma as well. Uh, this today we're going to cover white blood cells. And so let's look at these white blood cells. So a couple of things about white blood cells. Remember we already know that these are complete cells. And so that means that they have all the parts of a cell. They have a nucleus. They have organelles. They're complete cells. They're the only ones that are actually true cells in blood. So remember we did this thing where we centrifuge blood and the heaviest part's going to wind up down at the bottom. The lightest part winds up at the top. And we already talked about plasma, which is the lightest part. Remember, that's the liquid portion of blood. And so we talked about it. And then down at the bottom is the heaviest part, and that are is red blood cells. And that's what we spent most of our time talking about last time, red blood cells. But there's this little thin layer right here in the middle, which is called the buffy coat. And in that buffy coat is where we're going to find white blood cells. Now we're also going to find platelets here as well. So we're going to talk about both of these today. So if you look at white blood cells, there's more than one type. When we talk about red blood cells, there's only one type of red blood cell, just one. But when we look at white blood cells, there are five types. There are five. Well, you can divide those up into groups, but all of them are called white blood cells or they're called leukocytes. So remember, these are complete cells. They have a nucleus. They have other organelles. Because they have a nucleus, they can divide. Because they have the other organelles, they can do lots of other things. Their job is all about defense. So they protect the body. They defend the body from pathogens. Now, a pathogen we're going to talk about more next time in a different chapter. But gen means to create. So a pathogen creates something. And when it creates, pathos means disease. And so white blood cells then, their job is to prevent us from getting sick, to prevent disease. Now they have some other functions too. They also remove damaged tissue, damaged cells. They also get rid of abnormal cells. And then they also eat and remove things like waste products, toxins, and that sort of thing. Some of these cells can move. In other words, they can actually sort of crawl. And so when they crawl, it looks a little bit like a um, single-celled organism called an amoeba. And so this is called amoeboid movement. And basically, they just sort of crawl along surfaces just a little bit at a time. They crawl. That's what amoeboid, move, amoeboid movement looks like. They can also escape the, the blood vessels. So inside a blood vessel, a capillary, remember they're leaky. So if we look at these leaky capillaries, remember some of them have little holes in them. So they have little pores. And so this big cell can sort of squeeze out of these little holes. That's called margination. And then another thing that these cells have, or another capability, is that they can travel not just randomly, but toward stuff. And what they travel toward are chemicals, chemicals that damaged tissues release, or chemicals that bacteria release. And so they are attracted to chemicals. So that's chemo. Taxi means to move. In other words, they move not randomly, but they move toward a chemical. So they're going to come from this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. So if you injure yourself and you injure tissues, these white blood cells are going to come from all over the place, not just one place, but all over the place they're attracted to. And then some white blood cells can do phagocytosis. And phagocytosis, remember phago means to eat. 
and that's what they do. They sort of eat. And so if this is a, a substance, here comes a white blood cell, and what it's going to do is it's going to send out little arm-like structures and surround it. And then what's going to happen is it's going to pull it to the inside. And so it sort of ate it. And then what happens is usually destruction of that whatever it is. We're going to destroy it. So they have some neat properties that what red blood cells and other cells don't have. Any questions about any of that? Well, we don't have very many white blood cells, at least not compared to red blood cells. Um, yeah, we'll get to, Daryl, we'll get to the numbers that come uh, with each. But white blood cells, we don't have that many of them. So remember when we centrifuge this thing, we get all the liquid part up here. That's about 55%. And down here, that's close to 45%. That's the red blood cells. So this is actually less than 1% of the total of blood. And that includes not only white blood cells, but also platelets. So we have nowhere near as many of them. If we look at red blood cells, remember we have about 5 million red blood cells in every milliliter of blood. But if we look at white blood cells, the number ranges between 7,000 and 11,000. Anything above 11,000 is considered there's something wrong. Maybe you're sick, maybe something like that. But look, 7 to 11,000 versus 5 million. And that's why they take up so little space. And so here's where they're located, right here in this layer, which is called the Buffy coat. That's where the white blood cells are. So even when we look in here, I don't want to try to do it, but if we were to count how many red blood cells were in this picture, there would be a bunch of them. I don't know how many, but let's say 400. But if we look and see the white blood cells, that's a white blood cell, that's a white blood cell, and that's a white blood cell. Look, there are only four in this whole picture. These over here are platelets. So very few white blood cells compared to the number of red blood cells. And so the normal range, again, is 7 to 11,000. Anything above 11,000, that only happens if you're sick. Any questions? So that means that for every red blood cell we have, tons more of them, look, we have 700 to 1,000 of these red blood cells for every single white blood cell. So the ratio of white blood cells to red blood cells is about one to a thousand. Not very many. So they occupy this little bitty layer. And again, remember they're called leukocytes. Well, not all leukocytes are the same. There are five different types of of white blood cells, and they're divided up into two groups. So one group is called granulocytes. The reason they're called that is because they have granules in their cytoplasm, and they look granular, grainy looking. They have granules. But then there are also some that do not have any granules. They're agranulocytes. So remember, if you put A in front of the word, it means no or without. So they have no granules. And you can see this on the slide. So if we look here, here are the five different types. And look in there. Don't look at here. That's the nucleus. But in there, you can see these little granules. And if we look in here, look at the granules. These are bright, bright, bright red granules. And if we look in here, what we see are these dark purple granules dark blue, almost black looking granules. But when we look in here, in the cytoplasm, there are no granules. 
And if we look in here in the cytoplasm, and there's not much of it, but in that cytoplasm, there are no granules. So these are the granulocytes, and these are the agranulocytes. Make sense to everyone? So let's look at them. They all come from the same place. And remember we said that when we make a red blood cell, there are these stem cells and bone marrow. And if you use the right hormone, it's going to turn into red blood cells. And remember that hormone was called EPO. It came from the kidneys, erythropoietin. So if you use that hormone on this, we're going to get red blood cells. But there are other hormones. And those other hormones are going to cause this to turn into these white blood cells. And look, the exact same stem cell becomes all of the different white blood cells. Those hormones are called CSFs. And a CSF stands for Colony Stimulating Factor. And so we get a colony of white blood cells. Now there's a bunch of different CSFs. And we're not going to cover those. It's just too much detail. But needless to say that there's a different one for each one of these. And so we're going to get these five different types. Well, remember, we can divide them up into two groups, granulocytes and agranulocytes. So let's look at granulocytes first. So when you look at granulocytes, their name, every single one of them, ends in the word fill. Well, fill, the suffix, means to love. That's what it means. It means to love. So they love something. And what they love particular stain. So in other words, when we put stain on here, they're going to absorb the stain and they're going to change color. So the granules are what's going to change color. Well, the first guy to figure this out was a guy named Wright. And he developed this stain, which is called Wright stain, which is still used today. Wright stain is actually a combination of two stains. So right stain has two stains in it. One of these is called eosin. So eosin, when you look at it, it's a bright red stain. Bright red. It's almost scarlet in color. That's what it looks like. So if you can think about the reddest piece of cloth that you can imagine, the reddest shirt or whatever, this is what it looks like. And so some of these cells love eosin. The other stain he used was called basic blue. Sometimes it's called methylene blue. But look at the name of it, basic blue. So it's blue. It's blue. Dark blue. Almost black sometimes that's so blue. And so some of these granules love this dark blue and they'll absorb it and so we call that basophils so he put both of these stains together in one bottle and then when you put it on the cells some cells are attracted to one of these some cells are attracted to the other eosin is acidic so anything that likes acid will absorb it. Basic blue, look, it's got the word basic in it. It's basic. And so anything that loves bases will absorb it. Well, some things like both. Something absorbs acids and bases. And so when that happens, we're going to get a combination of red and blue. We're going to get purple. And if you look here, these cells, they don't love eosin. They don't love base, uh, basic blue. They're neutral. They love both. And so when we look at these, we're going to see 
red granules. When we look at these, we're going to see blue granules. And when we look at these, we're going to see the combination, which is kind of purple granules. Does that make sense to everyone? Basophils love the blue. Noble is neutral. Okay, so not only of that, but here's some other things about these, these cells. For one thing, um, they don't live very long. They're short-lived. And another thing, they're phagocytic. They eat stuff. Now, these are called microphages, not macro. So they eat stuff, but they don't eat a lot. They eat a little. So it's almost like they're on a little diet or something. They eat a little bit. They do phagocytosis a little bit. Let's look at these individual ones. Here they are. So there are three types. Remember, they all end in this word, fill. And look, even from the pictures, you can tell why they're named the way they are. So remember, eosin is red. So those granules absorb this red stain, and they turn this bright red color. Basophil means basic blue, and it's blue. And so look, they absorb this blue. It's almost black, really. And then neutrophils, remember, they're going to absorb both. And so what we're going to see is purple granules. And so that's what these are right here. Does it make sense? So visually, you can tell them apart. They don't do the same things, though. They're different cells. So let's talk about them individually. And let's look at neutrophils first. So neutrophils have two types of granules. So they take up both dyes, the basic and the acid. And so you get sort of a purple color. Red plus blue equals purple. Well, if you had to look at the neutrophil and recognize them from these granules, it would be really hard. And the reason it would be hard is because these granules are tiny. They're tiny and they're hard to see. They're very diffuse. But fortunately, there's a much easier way to recognize a neutrophil. And that is to look at its nucleus. So if we look at the nucleus of a neutrophil, it looks like this. They have a very weird nucleus. The nucleus for most cells, we think of it as being round. But look, there's no way that's round. This is the shape it has. And it's got these little connections. So in other words, this nucleus has lobes to it. And if I look at this one, it's got three lobes. But if I look at this one, it's got like five lobes. And that's exactly the way they are. They generally have somewhere between three and five lobes. So if you look at them under a microscope, they're easy to identify. You can still see these purple granules in here. But remember, these granules are tiny. But look at this nucleus. No other cell has a nucleus anything like that. And so it makes it very, very easy to recognize. Everybody see this weird nucleus? And look, now the granules are a little harder to see. But three lobes. It's a weird nucleus. There are only cells that are like that. So it's easy to recognize. So that's neutrophils. Well, neutrophils, a little bit more about them is that neutrophils are the cells that kill bacteria. They're bacteria slayers. They're also the most common type of white blood cell. The most common. About 70% of all your white blood cells are going to be neutrophils. So when you look at a blood slide, you're going to see a lot of neutrophils. The way they kill bacteria is they use almost something like a little, I don't know, explosion, I guess. 
It's called a respiratory burst, a respiratory burst. And basically what it is, is peroxide. It's peroxide. Many of you ever poured peroxide on your skin, like you got a cut or something, and you pour it on there to, to um, kill things? Well, look, it kills bacteria. That's why we put it on there. It kills stuff. And then if you've ever watched it, what it does is it bubbles like crazy. In other words, it's going to turn into this sort of respiratory burst. And that's what they do. They have an enzyme in their cytoplasm that can create peroxide. The enzyme is called peroxidase. It can create peroxide, and the peroxide then kills bacteria. There are also enzymes in here that help to destroy the bacteria by chopping it up. So they chop it up into little pieces. And then there are also some proteins in here that act like toxins or poisons to bacteria. So they kill bacteria and they do it three different ways. With this peroxide, with these hydrolytic enzymes, and with these proteins which sort of chop it up. Those are called defensins. So, most common type, very easy to recognize. They have this three to five lobes, and then they have red and blue. Look, red and blue granules. And so when you put red and blue together, you get this sort of purple color. Again, they look like this. The most common type, remember, it's about 70% of all the white blood cells are going to be these. Any questions about neutrophils? Okay, let's look at eosinophils. So remember, eosinophils love eosin. So they absorb the eosin like crazy. And so when you look at them, you see these bright red, big granules. And so when we look at them, there's the granules. And what they do is they use these granules to kill things. What they kill is not bacteria. What they kill are parasites. So if, you, if your dog were to get worms, like roundworms or hookworms or something, if you were to take a blood sample from that dog because it has worms, you're going to have an elevated eosinophil count. There's going to be a lot more of them in there. Well, usually there's not very many at all. Only about 1 to 4% of the white blood cells are going to be eosinophils. So they're not very common. So when you look at a blood slide, you're not going to see very many of them. But when you do, they're very easy to recognize. They tend to have a bilobe nucleus. And they have this red, bright red, large granules. And they use those to attack things like parasitic worms. They also help to reduce the effect of some allergies. When we get to allergies, we'll see that there are three, uh, four types of allergies. And this one has to reduce what's called type 3 allergies. So, here's what they look like, and here's what they really look like. Really easy to recognize. So there's our bilobe nucleus, and then here are all these red staining granules. Lots and lots and lots of these red staining granules. Remember, we don't have very many of these. It's only about 1 to 4%. Any questions about eosinophils? Okay, well, let's look at basophils. So we already know that basophils love this basic blue. And remember that blue is so dark, it's almost black, actually. 
And so when we look at it, we're going to see huge granules that are purplish black, dark, dark black granules. Those granules contain chemicals, and one of the chemicals they contain is histamine. Well, histamine is the chemical that causes all kinds of things to happen. A lot of these are we associate with scent with uh, allergies. It causes things like swelling. It causes things like itching. If it's in your nose, it'll make your nose itch, and then you'll sneeze. It's in your throat, you cough. It's in your eyes, the eyes tear and they itch and they swell. And so if you think about hay fever, all of the symptoms of hay fever, or in this part of the country, cedar fever, if you had that, all those symptoms are caused by histamine. And so if you want to get rid of those symptoms, if you don't want them to happen, we take a drug which acts like an antihistamine. So what it does is it prevents the effects of histamine. So we don't swell, we don't itch, we don't sneeze, we don't cough. Well, when we look at these, these are the least common type of white blood cell. The least common. It's only about half of 1%. About a half of a percent. And so if you look at a blood slide, you're going to see very, very, very few of these. But when you do see them, they're easy to recognize. They tend to have a U-shaped or an S-shaped nucleus. So in other words, it looks a little bit like this, or it looks a little bit like this. But the nucleus is hard to see because there's so many of these dark, dark, dark granules. The granules tend to obscure the nucleus. Same thing over here. This one would obscure the nucleus. And so if you can see it, it tends to have two lobes. But most of the time you don't see it. And so when you look at them, they look like this. Now, in this drawing, you can see the nucleus. So look, two lobes, two lobes, two lobes, two lobes. But here are those granules. And remember, those granules have chemicals, and one of those is histamine. So these cells are connected to or associated with inflation. We're going to talk about inflammation a whole lot when we get to the immune system. But inflammation is what we think of when we think of all those symptoms. Swelling also turns red. It gets hot. And it hurts. And histamine is associated with all of those. So here's what a real one looks like. How many lobes do you see? Can you see? Anybody tell how many lobes this nucleus has? That's right. Usually you cannot see it. But it's really easy to see these granules. And depending on the person who stained it and how long it was left in the stain or whatever, it may look blue, but usually it almost looks black. That's how dark they are. Any questions? So those are the granulocytes. Let's look at the A granulocytes. So remember A in front of a word means no or without, no granules. So when we look in the cytoplasm here, we're not going to see granules. It's going to look very smooth. It tends to be sort of a purple color, but it's not grainy. It's just smooth and purplish. There are two types of agranulocytes. And look at their names. Their names do not end in fill. It ends in sight. So we have monocytes and lymphocytes. Again, no granules, no granules. 
So let's look at these different types. Here's what they look like. Now this is not the best picture, but still you can see there's no granules in there. Well look, these two cells look nothing alike. Let's look at them individually. Let's look at lymphocytes first. So lymphocytes are the second most common type of white blood cell. And if you look at how many there are, it's about 25%. So they're easy to find. They're also very easy to recognize because they're a round cell with a round nucleus. And they're the only ones that are like that. Round cell with a round nucleus. Another way to recognize them is the nucleus is huge compared to the cell. So they have a very large circular nucleus and you're going to see very little cytoplasm, just a thin little rim. So here's the nucleus and here's the cell like this and they're almost the same size but it's a round cell and a round nucleus. When we get to the immune system, we'll talk a lot more about lymphocytes. And then we'll talk about types of lymphocytes. There are two types, and they're called T cells and B cells. Well, we'll learn this more when we get there, but T stands for thymus. And one of the reason they're called that is because this is where they mature. They mature in the thymus. And B stands for bone marrow because this is where they mature. So T and B have to do with just the site of maturation. And then they're both going to be involved in immunity. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But here's what lymphocytes look like. So look, this is a better lymphocyte than these other pictures. Round cell, round nucleus. So look at this one. Round cell, round nucleus. Round cell, round nucleus. And look how big the nucleus is. And look how small the cytoplasm is. This other one over here is even more so. Huge nucleus and very little cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm doesn't have any granules in it because remember these are agranulocytes. But these are easy to recognize. They're also easy to find because remember about 25% of this white blood cells are going to be these lymphocytes. And then the last one are monocytes. Monocytes are the biggest of all the white blood cells. They're very, very large. They're two to three times as big as a red blood cell. So that makes them easy to recognize. Somewhere between four and eight percent of the my, uh, my leukocyte monocytes. And so when you look at them, they're big. They also tend to have an irregular outline. It's not round, it's irregular. And then they have a bilobed nucleus. They said they're going to be horseshoe shaped or dumbbell shaped. So they look something like that. Remember, they have no granules. They're agranular, no granules. And the cytoplasm tends to stain this sort of purple, lilac color. Monocytes become macrophages. So look, this word means big eater. They eat stuff like crazy. They're a big, big eater. And they can enter, eat all kinds of things. They eat bacteria, they eat viruses, they eat uh, damaged tissue and cells. They're all very much about eating. So look, here's that 
outline, there's the nucleus. Here's that outline, there's the nucleus. Here's what one really looks like. So look how big it is. If you compare it to a red blood cell, but they're two to three times bigger. And then they have this either horseshoe or dumbbell-shaped nucleus. Any questions? So here's a summary slide for you. And this has everything on it. We've already talked about red blood cells, but this is here. So look, it tells you the cell type, it shows you what it looks like, it gives you a description, it tells you how many there are, how long they live, and what their function is. So remember we went down this list, and, and so we talked about what they do, but this is a great summary slide. Continuation of it is on the next slide. So here are our granulocytes, and here are the agranulocytes. Platelets are here too. Guys, don't click the PowerPoints, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how these leukocytes are produced. So remember, we already said, and I reminded you that EPO is the hormone that causes red blood cells to be produced. Remember, EPO comes from the kidney, and it goes to the red bone marrow and increases the number of red blood cells. White blood cells work similarly, but it's not EPO, it's a different thing. And there again, they're called colony stimulating factors. And so when we look at it, we're going to get these different types of white blood cells. So it depends on which colony stimulating factor I give this cell. If I give it one, it's going to go this way. And I'm going to get eosinophils. If I give it a different one, it's going to go this way and I'm going to get basophils, and so on. Again, there's a lot of these, and we're not going to go over them. Well, remember, we normally have somewhere between 7 and 11,000 white blood cells per milliliter. But if you get sick, these are the army that you're going to fight off the bacteria with. So you would expect the number of white blood cells to go up. So it would go above 11,000. And so if you do have a white blood cell count above 11,000, it's a good indication that you've got some sort of infection. If you don't have an infection, though, and you have this above 11,000 white blood cells, and something is wrong. And some people, this goes up even higher. So it goes 12,000, 20,000, 120,000. Sometimes it goes into the millions. So 2 million. Well, think about it. It's in the blood. And if I've got 2 million of them in here, I'm going to have less space for red blood cells. Not only do you have these so many of them, but they tend to be non-functional. They don't work. They don't do anything. They just take up space. Something is causing the development of all these. That condition, when you have so many of them, is called leukemia. And so there's a lot of different types of leukemia, but they all involve this elevated number of white blood cells. It may be just one white blood cell type, just one type that's being elevated, but it could be more than one type. It could be two types. Usually, though, you can look at it and you get to see what type it is. A lot of times we have tissues like tumors that are producing these white blood cells. So if a tumor is producing lymphocytes, it's called a lymphoma. So it's a type of cancer is what it is. Any questions about that? 
Okay, those are white blood cells. Let's look at platelets. So platelets are these cells down here. Are these not cells, actually, pieces of cells. When you look at them, they're not cells. They're just little pieces. They are granular when you look at them. They have granules in the cytoplasm. But since they're not cells, they're not going to have a nucleus. They're not going to have organelles. And I don't know if you can actually say that they're alive, but they don't last very long. They only last about a week, maybe a week and a half. And so we're constantly have to, to pump out platelets because they don't last very long. But let's look at platelets. They're these little disks. Again, they're pieces of cells. And the cell that they're pieces of is called a megakaryocyte. Mega means big. These are very big cells. And what they do, this huge cell sheds cytoplasm. And that shed cytoplasm becomes a platelet. Well, when you look at them again, they don't last very long, a little over a week. And then they're removed. And they're removed by phagocytes, mostly those monocytes that become macrophages. And so one of the jobs, these macrophages is to get rid of these old platelets. Here's a platelet. Look, they're not big. These are sort of all by themselves. But they usually don't travel that way. They travel in groups. And so you see a bunch of platelets. What they do is all about blood clotting. And so we're going to talk about clotting in just a little bit. But platelets are involved in that because they help form sort of a patch, a plug in the wall. So if you have a cut, there's a hole in the, the vessel. Blood is leaking out. These platelets plug it up. Now, they're not a clot, but they help in clotting. So these megakaryocytes are going to release the platelets, and platelets are going to circulate around, and then they're going to do their job. And again, they don't travel by themselves usually. Look, I don't know how many that is, but it's a bunch of platelets. They're not just one or two. So same thing here. Here's our stem cell. And we're going to have to have a hormone. The hormone here is called thrombopoietin. Like EPO was epopoietin. This is thrombopoietin. And thrombopoietin is going to cause this to happen. And look, there's that giant cell. And that giant cell begins to shed platelets. So we're going to go from this, this pathway until we get to this huge cell, and then we're going to get the platelets being released. It looks like this. So there's our hemocytoblast. That's that stem cell. We're going to give it that hormone, that thrombopoietin. And it's going to change. It's going to get bigger. It's going to develop all these little granules in it. Get even bigger. And then little pieces of this thing are going to be shed. And those become the platelets. So <clears throat> that's white blood cells and platelets. And so we finished up what the components or the formed elements uh, of the blood look like. Anyone have any questions? Okay, well, the only other thing we're going to talk about with blood right now is hemostasis. And what hemostasis is is just prevention of loss. 
if you cut yourself, you're going to bleed. And so you're going to lose blood. Well, you also, as you lose blood, you're going to lose blood pressure. And remember, we cannot live without blood pressure because blood pressure is what's pushing the blood along. Well, we're going to do a bunch of things to bring up blood pressure, and we've already talked about those things. Remember, we're going to increase heart rate. We're going to increase contractility. We're going to do all kinds of things to bring up uh, blood pressure. We're going to release hormones like ADH and aldosterone and all that stuff. But if the hole is still there, the hole is still in the vessel, it's just going to keep bleeding. And we'll continue to have to worry about this blood pressure. And so the blood has responsibility for preventing its loss. In other words, blood has a responsibility for clotting. And that's basically what hemostasis is. It's the formation of a clot. So let's look at how that happens. So you've cut yourself. It might look something like this. Look, there's a hole right there. And if you don't do something, the blood's just going to keep coming out of this hole and keep coming out of this hole until you bleed out. So we're going to plug that hole up. It happens in three phases. So the first phase is called the vascular phase. Vascular means vessels. So in other words, it's the responsibility of the vessel, the blood vessel, to do something. And the next phase is the platelet phase. And so now platelets are going to get involved. Remember those are those Latin discs with those chemicals and those granules. And then finally, though, separate from both of these is what's called coagulation or clot formation. So platelets are not part of clot formation. Well, not directly, anyway. So three steps. Vascular phase, platelet phase, phase and coagulation. And here's what's going to happen. Here's our vascular phase. And what happens with the vascular phase is we're going to get vasoconstriction. So it's like a reflex. If you cut this blood vessel, it reflexively contracts. The muscle contracts. You get a spasm, basically. And that spasm is going to cause this to constrict. Well, remember, if you vasoconstrict, what happens is the, the internal diameter gets smaller. And so less blood is going to escape. And then what's going to happen is platelets are going to come along and they're going to fill up the hole. And we're going to get what's called a platelet plug, a loose platelet plug. It's not a clot. And then finally, hopefully we've stopped the blood, at least temporarily. And then finally, a whole bunch of clotting factors are going to cause the production of something called fibrin. And fibrin is going to act like a fishnet, sort of. It's going to form a net. And that net is going to trap all kinds of red blood cells and white blood cells all like trapping fish in a net. And then what it's going to do is these platelets are going to contract. And when they contract, it's going to tighten it up. So let's look at those phases. So let's look at the vascular phase first. Remember what's going to happen is it's going to be a constriction of the blood vessel. It's like a spasm. So look, if I cut this blood vessel like that, look, this is what it does. Automatically, it's going to spasm. So look at here. Here's the internal diameter of this one. This is before the cut happened. And now look, there's the internal diameter afterwards. So lots of blood is going to go through here. But here, only a tiny amount of blood can go through there. 
So that's going to reduce blood loss a lot. But think about this. This is muscle. Muscle that's doing this. What happens when muscle gets tired? What does it do? It's going to relax. As it gets tired, this is going to go back to this again. And unless we've done something in the meantime, we're going to have lots of blood coming back out again. So this is very, very temporary. It is not a permanent solution at all. But during that vascular spasm, the platelets become activated. The way platelets activate is that, remember, there's layers to blood vessels. And no matter where you are, there's this inside layer, the tunica interna. And that tunica interna, remember, is simple squamous epithelium. And it's this very smooth, unbroken surface. And so the blood, along with the platelets, just slides along, just slides along. It's like a slip and slide that you might buy for your kids in the summer. It just slides along. It's very smooth. But if you break in the vessel, the break is going to create a jagged area, a rough area right here. And especially if collagen is exposed, when those platelets get to that area, those platelets are going to go crazy. And here's what they're going to do. So here's a normal blood vessel, and there's that tunica interna right there, that smooth, simple squamous epithelium. And as long as that's what we're in contact with, no clotting is going to happen. But look, now we're going to have a break, and we're going to expose collagen here. And what's going to happen is those little platelets that are floating around in here are going to do this. When they get to the collagen, they're going to kind of go crazy. They're going to swell. They're going to get very, very sticky. They stick to each other, and they stick to the walls of the surface. And then they also release chemicals. So those granules, remember, we have those granules in there. They're chemicals. And what's going to happen is the chemicals are going to make more platelets do the same thing. So now even more platelets are going to swell up and get sticky and they're going to stick to each other. And then they're going to release even more chemicals. And so even more platelets. We're going to get this positive feedback mechanism. Everybody remember positive feedback? Remember what happens? You get further and further away from normal. So normal was this. It was no lot. That's normal. But when I cut a hole and blood's coming out, I can't rely on normal in order to fix this. And so I switch from negative feedback to positive feedback. And that happens right here when those platelets come into contact with this wall. And then look, first it's just a few platelets. And then it's a lot more platelets. And then it's a lot more platelets until there's enough platelets to plug up the hole. We're going to get this loose platelet plug. It's not a clot. It's a platelet plug. It's a little bit like jelly. So think about jelly. Jelly is not very durable at all. It's going to fall apart really easily. So it's a very, very temporary thing. But temporarily, at least, it's going to stop the blood from leaving the vessel. It's going to stop the bleeding. 
Now, if you move or if you juggle or bump this thing, that, because it's like jelly, is just going to break loose. Just going to break loose. And as soon as that happens, we're going to start bleeding again. We're going to go back to this, and we're going to have to go back through this part again. Make sense so far? Any questions? So remember, we do not have a clot yet. No clot. That's a whole different process. And that process is called coagulation. So there's our platelet plug right there. Well, look, these can tissues were damaged. Look, they were torn. And the platelets, remember, were releasing chemicals. So we're going to get all kinds of chemicals being released, some from the tissue. Some of the chemicals is going to come from the plates. So it's going to come in here. And what these chemicals are going to do is they're going to start coagulation. And here's what we're going to get. This is a clot. So when look at this, look, it looks like a fish net. And remember, it traps red blood vessels and white blood vessels and platelets. It traps it like a fishnet. So that's what we're going to make. That is not the same thing as this platelet plug. This is a clot. So how do we get to this clot? Well, the process is called coagulation. And coagulation is not simple. It's a complicated process. So in our blood already, our liver, if you look at the liver, it kind of looks sort of like this. It's big. The liver does a bunch of different things. But one of the things it does is it makes a bunch of chemicals. And those chemicals, at least the ones we're talking about, are called coagulants. Coagulants. They're released in an inactive form. So they're just floating around in the blood. In order for the kidney, or the sorry, the liver to make these, you got to have vitamin K. Without it, you can't make coagulants. But again, they're floating around in the blood and they're inactive. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to activate them. We're going to have to activate these coagulants. Well, there are two ways to activate them. In other words, there are two pathways. One is called extrinsic. And what that means is from the outside. And what we're saying when we say outside, it's outside the blood. In other words, it's not the blood doing it. It's the damaged tissue. So it's due to the tissue damage. This is where this comes from. So remember those chemicals that were released from the tissue damage? They're going to initiate this extrinsic pathway. But there's another pathway too. This one's called intrinsic. Intrinsic means inside. In other words, something inside the blood is going to activate this pathway. And the thing inside the blood that's doing it is the platelets. So remember those platelets released chemicals. Those chemicals made other platelets swell up and get sticky. But some of those chemicals initiate this pathway. And so look, one's coming from this direction. So here's our extrinsic pathway and it's a little bit like a bunch of dominoes and I know I use that analogy a lot but it works and then there's this other pathway that's the intrinsic it comes from a different place and again it's a bunch of dominoes like this 
what's going to happen is these two pathways are to join together. And when they join together, we get what's called the common pathway. So down here is the common pathway. And at the very bottom, what we're going to get is the clot. And that clot comes from something called fibrin. So fibrin is also produced by the liver. It's produced in an inactive form. That inactive form is called fibrinogen. And so fibrinogen just floats around in the blood. It doesn't do anything to anything until we go through this pathway or this pathway. And then fibrinogen gets converted to fibrin. So here's what those pathways look like. So there are a bunch of different clotting factors. Some clotting factors have names. Some of them have numbers. But remember, there are two pathways. So the, this one, remember, is from tissue damage. Tissue damage. So these cells here are damaged. That's our extrinsic pathway. And again, it's like domino. So here's the first domino. And then that one knocks over this one. And that's the second domino. And that one knocks over this one. That's the third domino. And then that's the fourth domino. And then the fifth. And then the sixth. And then the seventh. And look, we're going to get to fibrin. We could also go the other pathway, though. Remember, that's from the platelets. So look, here are the platelets. They're releasing chemicals too. And that's our first domino. And then we have another domino and another domino and another domino and another one until we get to the clot. So I can go this way and get to the clot, or I can go this way and get to the clot. Or you could go both ways and get to the clot. So we're going to get tissue damage. And at the same time, we're going to have platelets reducing their factor. So this is going to happen and this is going to happen. So these two pathways reinforce each other to make sure that we get to the clot. That's why there are two pathways. Well, if you look at this again, there's a lot of different things on here, and I'm not going to ask you to remember all of them. The only ones I do want you to remember are the ones in the common pathway. And it's not very complicated. Common pathway starts with factor 10, and it activates something called prothrombinase. Prothrombinase then takes this, which the liver made, prothrombin, and converts it to thrombin. And thrombin then is going to take this, which the liver made, fibrinogen, and convert it to fibrin. So if you look over here, here's the common pathway. So this is at factor 10, and then prothrombinase, thr prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin. And then we're going to get a clot. So some point or another, come back and fill this out. Here are the answers over here. And use it as a study aid. Any questions about it? So let's go back real quick. And we had this three phases. So remember, here it is. Here's our vascular phase, the vascular spasm. The muscle contracts. We get vasoconstriction. And then the next thing, the platelets are going to adhere to the walls of the vessel, and we're going to develop this platelet plug. But remember, the platelets are also releasing chemicals. And so the damaged tissue here and these platelets are going to cause coagulation to happen. And remember, there's two pathways to coagulation. There's the external, which comes from here. 
and there's the internal, which comes from here, and then we have the common. So Sarah says, so fibrinogen is already in the blood. That's exactly right. It's made by the liver and it's floating around. So if I take blood out of, out of your body and put it in a tube, and if I just let it sit there, it will clot by itself because the fibrinogen is already in the blood. And so after you let it set for a while, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have this hard clot forming down in the bottom. And then you're going to get, it's going to, you'll get the fluid that can, is left. That is not plasma. That has a different name. It's called serum. So serum is plasma minus fibrinogen. Any other questions? So, vascular phase looks like this. We get that spasm. Platelet phase looks like this. We're going to get this loose platelet plug. And then coagulation, remember, is this complex sort of like domino effect till we get to this clot. And so you can do it either by this way or this pathway. And then these two join together to form this pathway. And it looks like this. There's extrinsic. There's intrinsic. There's common. So we're going to get a clot. And then the last thing that happens is the platelets contract. So they're trapped in here. They're trapped in this right here and here. The platelets are in there. And what's going to happen is when they contract, then this clot is going to contract and it's going to pull the edges of the vessel closer together. And a clot is hard. It's a hard substance and it's durable and it's semi-permanent. So if you don't do anything to it, it's going to pretty much stay there. And so once healing happens, what we're going to do is we're going to dissolve the clot. And that's the very last stage of healing. And what causes that is an enzyme called plasmin. It's also made by the liver. And it's activated by this clot. And so what we're going to get is the fibrin is going to begin to be broken down. And so if we break down all of those strands, then the clot dissolves. And it does it gradually, not all at once, but it dissolves. Any questions? So remember I said it's this coagulation is a little bit like dominoes. And if you think about setting these dominoes up, and we've talked about this before, so here's a domino, here's a domino, there's one, there's one, there's one. And then we got these dominoes over here, there they are here, da, da, da. And then we got this domino here, 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 and finally we're going to have a clot. Well, what do you think would happen? If I were to go in and remove a domino, in other words, that's not there anymore. Could this play work? This one would fall, that one would fall, and then it would stop. Or if I went in and took this domino out, this one would stop. And so there are drugs that prevent this from happening. And here are some of those drugs. And they're used in um, 
medicine as anticoagulants. They also, if you interfere with vitamin K, remember vitamin K is necessary to make all of these. And so if you don't have vitamin K or if you interfere with it, you can't make them. And so if you don't make them, you're certainly not going to have a clot. There's also a genetic disease that prevents you from making them. So here's my dominoes, 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 but I can't make that one. It's gone. And then domino, domino, same thing on this side. Domino, 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 but I can't make this one. It's gone. And so when I get to here, it's going to stop. And so anyone who has this disease is going to have a very, very difficult time clotting. And so when we look at those genetic diseases, let's get this for a second, they're called hemophilia. So do you remember what phil means? It means to love. So these people love to bleed. They probably don't love to bleed, but that's what it means. In other words, they can't produce clots. And there's three, or actually more than this, but there's three common types of hemophilia, and they're just designated by letters. But these different types, every single one of them, there's a deficiency of one of those clotting factors. The most common type has a deficiency of factor eight. The second most common type has a deficiency of factor nine. And then a very, very uncommon type and also sort of mild type is when you have a deficiency of factor 11. But there are other ones too. There's von Hildebrand's disease. And anyway, you can look this up if you want. Just look it for genetic um, genetic diseases associated with with lack clotting. Hildebrand. There we go. Von Hildebrand's disease. I used to raise Dobermans when I was a kid, and Doberman dogs. Somewhere in their development, some dog who became pretty common sire had von Hildebrand disease. So like all purebred dogs, they have issues. And one of the issues with Dobermans is they have this von Hildebrand disease and they can't clot. And so if they get bitten or cut or hurt, they tend to bleed to death which is not a very good thing for a guard dog. But anyway, anybody have any questions? Okay, let's back up a little bit. Remember we were talking about platelets. So platelets are only supposed to do this when we have a cut. So if we don't have a cut like this, we would not want platelets to stick to this wall and form a clot here. We could dump a whole clot right there, but this is a healthy blood vessel. And so if I have a clot in this blood vessel, look what it's going to do. It's going to decrease the internal diameter and it's going to reduce blood flow. So I would not want that to happen. Not only that, but sometimes this clot can detach. And what it does now, it's a free floating clot and it goes somewhere. And what it usually does is it goes to a vessel that it's bigger than the vessel, or at least as big as it, and it completely occludes the vessel. Well, when that happens, whatever's down here is going to die, basically. So we would not want this clot. And we would not want this free-floating clot either. So a clot in an unbroken vessel is called a thrombus. So a thrombus, it's a clot in an unbroken blood vessel. 
And so it blocks circulation. Depending on where it is, it could kill some tissues. But if it's, say, in the heart or the brain, it could kill the whole person. Remember, though, sometimes this thing detaches. When it detaches, it's called an embolus. So an embolus is a free-floating clot. And what it's going to do, like I said, is it's going to go through blood vessels until it gets to a blood vessel that it's either as big or bigger. So if this is the clot here and it's floating along, look, it won't block this. But when it gets here, it blocks this completely. And whatever is over here is going to die. So we can get things like strokes. We can get things like pulmonary emboli, which can't. That means you can't then obtain oxygen. So neither one of those is a very desirable situation. The opposite of that is when you have too few platelets. We don't have enough platelets. Well, what can you do not do without platelets? You can't clot. And if you can't clot anything that breaks a blood vessel, you're going to bleed like crazy. That bleeding can be externally, but it can also be internally. When you have too few platelets, it's called thrombocytopenia. And so the number of platelets is too few. It's deficient. And so you have hemorrhages all over the place. Thrombocytopenia can be caused by lots of different things. The way it's treated is with a transfusion. Any questions? Well, that's the end of that. And we're actually so close to the end of the time that we're just going to stop there. Any questions?